for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and right before he came, uh, sorry, an author as well, and right before he came to Australia, he was actually on reserve duty serving in Gaza or near Gaza um, to fight the current battle um, and in his, military, in his role as, uh, in the military as a Navy SEAL. So really a man of many hats um, and talking tonight about this issue of uh, Israeli-Palestinian statehood and some sort of resolution to the conflict, although I guess in the current situation it's hard, it might be hard to see that glimmer of light, but perhaps Dr. Hendel will, will shed some light on that very uh, conundrum. Without any further ado, I welcome him to the stage. Thank you very much, and I'm not sure that I'm going to shed a light on this subject because there is a lot of darkness, but also a few points that we can understand when we are talking about the future of uh, the Israeli-Palestinian <coughs> conflict, and the good news is that most of the Israelis today are uh, reaching the point, uh, the pragmatic point, the, prag the pragmatic period. Most of the Israelis understand the limitations and the opportunities. Uh, the bad news is there, that En Chadash Tachat as we says in Hebrew, which means there is nothing new under the sun, as Kohelet says. And uh, still the problems, the same problems that we knew at the past are still exist. The same people uh, live in the, the same place and arguing about the same territory and about the same religious aspects. Uh, one is talking about God or Elohim, one is talking about Allah, and at the end of the day they are all arguing about the same things. Now, in January 2012, I was sent by uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, I was uh, the Director of Communications and Public Diplomacy, I was sent to Amman, uh, Jordan, in order to be part of the negotiation team with uh, Palestinians. And it was, uh, for me, it was very interesting experience. And we sat together in the house of the Muhabarat, which means in Arabic, uh, the intelligence. <coughs> uh, and those are the people, if you know Jordan, those are the people that uh, actually organizing everything. The Muhabarat are responsible for um, actually of, for everything inside the state, including putting people in, uh, in the jobs, the, the high level uh, um, positions. And they're also respons responsible for the connections between Israel and Jordan. Most of those connections, pro uh, as you, if you know or if not, most of those connections are not on the headlines of Jordan and are not in the headlines uh, in most of the newspapers in the world since the Jordans are, we have a peace agreement, but they prefer not to put it in front of everyone since, and I said it uh, before, the Arabic countries, even those that we have peace with them, prefer to uh, put those connections in a, in a very low in a very low voice. Now, those Muhabarat intelligence officers took me, took us from the bridge, from Allenby Bridge. It's a very interesting experience. It's like to take a ferry in a very uh, stormy day. And uh, with the, those black Mercedes, we got into the, to the headquarters of the Muhabarat in, in Amman, of the intelligence in Amman. And we met uh, Muhammad Shtia and Sai Barikat, the same couple that sat one for the last year with uh, Tsipi Livni and with uh, Itzik Molcha, who is, who is the representer uh, of uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. And we sat there, me and Molcha and another guy from, the, from our uh, uh, military. And we had, as I said before, uh, we had very good coffee. We had very good uh, baklava, which is very sweet if you know it, and it's very tasty. And the hospitality was great, and the Jordanians gave us really good treatment. And uh, Mansour, which is the foreign minister office in Jordan, which belonged to the Hashemite family, of course, because all the high-rank uh, Jordanians belong to the Hashemite family, uh, treat us very well, and they, he gave us the rule 
the rules, what we can do and what we cannot do, what we can publish and what we cannot publish after that, and we all agree that everything is going to be secretly, and we are not going to publish everything. Of course, at one moment after we left, we found everything on the in the Aris newspaper, which means that Saib, which is a big mamzer, as we said in Hebrew, uh, <laughs> Saib sent everything to Barak Ravid, which today is a friend of mine, but he's the uh, reporter of, of, uh, of Aretz. <laughs> and uh, it was a very nice experience, but without any outcomes. Since at the moment that we sat and started talking, we, I found myself in the middle of two lawyers, one of them is Itzik Molchov from the Israeli side, and one of them is Sai Barika, and they all, they all talked about the small details, and I know that God is in the small details, but since we had so many small details, at the end of the day we couldn't speak about anything. And this is part of what actually Israel is doing with the Palestinians for the last 20 years. Now, it's a kind of a way to change and to fix what's happened in Oslo Agreement. In Oslo Agreement, and I will speak about Oslo Agreements uh, later, but in Oslo Agreements, actually, both sides, and especially the Israelis and the West, were enthusiastic to sign an agreement and to have a peace agreement and to go to the White House and to have a Nobel Prize. And on the ways I forgot to look on the small details, and they look, they forgot to check and to see what exactly they are signing about, and how you can force both sides. By the way, I'm not, I'm an Israeli, and I'm a Zionist, and I'm going to present the Israeli side. But but both sides actually some they sign an agreement that it was very hard to fulfill. And especially when you have uh, someone like Arafat, which, he, which, which was until uh, one day a terrorist, and in the other day become suddenly a, a Nobel Prize a winner, and someone that uh, is uh, acceptable in all over the world. And since that period, I think that uh, both sides, and also the the external actors, and in that point, in 2012, January 2012, it was the Quartet uh, from Europe, but there are other actors like uh, 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 John Kerry and others. We always have some middlemen that helping us to bring us to nowhere. And <laughs> in that uh, uh, point, there was a, a Tony Blair with really good will to bring peace, with really good uh, uh, cocktails before that and after that, but with no peace. And before I'm starting to, before I'm, I will start uh, uh, talking about the the general picture, I would like to mention the problems. And I would like to uh, explain a little bit about the limitations, and then maybe we can understand how both sides are actually in a clash time after time without any new thinking out of the box. Now, what I'm telling you, it's not something that is, uh, I, am, I will say it like this, what I'm telling you, I'm telling to many other diplomats that come into Israel. And Israel is in the focus of many diplomats in the world. It's like the biggest challenge for diplomats in the West they all think that everything is growing from Israel, that uh, uh, if they will be able to finish, to put end to the conflict, the world will be better. And they all failed on the same time of the time, on the same point, points. And they really want to hear different approaches. But at the end of the day, after they hear someone like me and other people in Israel, and after they hear different voices and different op op opinions, they are coming back to the... Uh, for ministers or to the them office or when they uh, sending them report, they are writing the same things uh, about the same solution, which is the two-state solution, without really or without deeply understanding of those limitations. So first of all, let's talk about the settler. Usually, people usually uh, the si both sides are talking about Jerusalem and the refugees. But one of the limitations, and this is one 
big limitation. This is one of the limitations of the Israeli and inside the, Isra the, po the Israeli politics. It's the settlers. Now, I, men I mentioned it before. I grew up in a small settlement, five kilometers from the Green Line. Part of the settlement's blocks. And when I grew up in these settlements, I didn't, when I was a kid, I, I moved there when I was uh, 10 years old. And when I grew up in this place, I didn't know that there is something special in the place that I'm living in. I thought that it's quite normal to live in a place like this. I saw, I looked around, we have nice houses like in the country, um, red roof, um, dogs. We had Arabic neighbors, nothing was uh, different from other places. The Arabic neighbors came to us and we came to the Arabic villages. At, at that period, um, we, if we want to take the car and to go to Tel Aviv, it was 20 minutes driving from our place to Tel Aviv, which means Tel Aviv, as you know, it's a kind of a central city in the, inside Israel. And it looked very normal. And the first moment that I understood that there are doubts or there are debates about the place that I live was when uh, I joined the army and suddenly I met people from the Shomer Atzair, which is the left wing in the Israeli map, and they, they left and they, we argue about what we are going to do with the settlements. By the way, one of the things that I'm, unfortunately I'm saying, and I'm, I'm writing in my columns from time to time, that I, today when I'm going to my duty service and I meet the old friends from the army, I have no one to argue with. <laughs> Most of those Israelis, including those that grew up in the kibbutzim, become, we all become much, much more pragmatic. And those views of one side that uh, in one, that it's possible to bring peace in, with agreements, and the other views that uh, we can ignore the Palestinians completely, both sides become much more centralist, much more pragmatic regarding this conflict. Now, the play, when I see the people that grew up next to me, I don't see any kind more, I will say it like this. The majority of them are still uh, uh, belong to the right wing in Israel. But you see different types of people and different uh, prototype of uh, settlers. And we grew up in a settlement who was belong to uh, Bnei Akiva, the Mizrahi uh, stream inside, uh, inside Israel. And you could see different, uh, different type of people. One, I have a very good friend of mine that when he was a, very, uh, when he was a kid, he was terrible. He, uh, I, I remember that he borrowed some donkey from the Arabic village and he took it uh, all the way to school and the teacher had to... Anyway, very terrible guy. And today, is, uh, today of course, as all the legends today is a uh, hand is the owners of one of the biggest softwares in New York, in Manhattan, is doing a lot of money. Uh, as all the stories that, uh, the Israeli stories on success. But when you see the environment, it was a very natural environment and political environment. People vote for different parties, most of them in the right, but they were at the same time liberals, which means they saw everyone as a as human being without any connection to his religious. Now there were other settlements, <coughs> and those settlements were we had we have in Judea and Samaria cities like Ariel and Maale Adumim, and those people that came to live there, most of them came there from economic reasons because it was very cheap to buy apartments. They didn't plan to become a settlers. Part of them are still do not know that they are they called settlers in the eyes of others. And they moved there because they, are, uh, they look for a nice way for, of living and a cheap uh, way to buy apartments. And we have, all, we have also ultra-Orthodox that live in the settlement, two, two big cities of people that really do not uh, uh, get involved in all the political argument or all the political debate. And they just look for a place which will fit their own view as ultra-Orthodox, <coughs> and they live there. And when you check what are the settlers that we call, uh, uh, that we heard, and that we hear about them time after time, we see that from 350,000 settlers outside, and I'm not talking, I'm not including the, the 
um, neighbors inside Jerusalem or outside Jerusalem, as, a, as you want to call it, we see that most of those people are not really inside the political argument. Most of them came to Judea and Samaria in order to prove them life, in order to live in some place that is cheaper than, in, than Tel Aviv. So this is one thing that we need to know, but at the same time, and I will show you in the map, I will show you on the map in a few minutes, at the same time we need to know that if we have, that most of the settlers live in the settlement's blocks, and I will speak about it in a moment, but we have 100,000 people that live outside the settlement blocks, which means that if one want to withdraw from the uh, Judea and Samaria and to go back, for example, to the settlement block, which is, which is one of the plans, you need to uh, evacuate about 100,000 people, and those 100,000 people, they didn't come there in order to prove them lives, they came here because they came there for ideological reasons, and we can speak about it in a moment. The second problem is Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is a big world, and most of the Israelis, if you ask them, if you ask the Israeli in the street what he, what he think about Jerusalem, he will tell you that unite, that uh, uh, he believed in one Jerusalem without separation, without uh, uh, giving up on territories inside Jerusalem. But if you ask him about the neighborhoods inside Jerusalem, probably he will not recognize part, part of them. And the fact, the, to the matter of fact, Jerusalem today, it's a city with a wall that separates between a few Arabic neighborhoods and the most of the city. And inside the city, you have the old city, which is part on the border between 67 and part of it is on the border of before 67. And you have uh, the uh, historical Jerusalem, which is like uh, the Olive Mount and the other places. <coughs> and those places, if you look on them, they actually part of what the Palestinians want, but they actually part of what the Israelis believe that belong to us. And to separate, and there are people that are talking about separation between Arabic uh, neighborhoods and Jewish neighborhoods, to separate them, it's going to be very, very difficult if it's possible at all, because there is no surgencies that you can do in order to cut neighborhoods. And they are all mixing together. So this is another problem. Half a year ago, when Angela Merkel came to Israel, uh, the ambassador, the German ambassador, asked me to meet with her because I'm running some NGO inside Israel, and I had the opportunity to sit with her in her uh, fent house in the uh, King David Hotel. And we sat and she spoke about her ambitions to have uh, a two-state solution in the future. And when you look on the window of King David Hotel, I don't know if you have been there, but if you're looking from the window, you actually see the old city. Now, I told her that, look, the 67 borders that you are talking about is downstairs. It means that we are, actually, this is the border, downstairs, down from your window. Now, if you have any kind of um, magic sticks that can separate between this part and this part, maybe someone will use it, but it's almost impossible. And when people in Europe talking about the two-state solution, they are talking about different subjects, different issues, and different problems without really understanding the difficulties and the problems not only in the Israeli politi uh, uh, political environment and in the Palestinian political environment, but also geographically. The third problem, or the third limitation, is the refugees. Now, uh, you probably heard about uh, UNRWA, uh, the, um, the organization, the UN organization, but I'm sure that you didn't hear about the refugees organization for different refugees after the, se the Second World War. And you didn't hear about this organization because it does not exist anymore. Most of the refugees after the Second World War are already settled in many places, and after 10 years, this organization finished its job, and uh, there is nothing to do with it. 
the Palestinian Refugees Agency is still exist. And we are talking about the fourth generation of refugees, of people that call themselves refugees, and they live in Lebanon, in Syria. I'm sure that there are people even here in Australia. And those refugees, actually, they are the son of the sons of the sons of those, uh, of the sons of those refugees from 48. Now, if you are taking the numbers of 48, and there is a huge debate what happened over there, I'm a historian and I'm coming from the Zionistic perspective, so I have my own opinion, but there are people that will say that we, it's our fault, and you know the Palestinians call this day Nakba, which is the disaster of the Palestinians, and we call it the winning day, and I'm very proud that we won. And I don't care that they had Nakba, because if, they, if we had Nakba, probably Israel was not exist today. Mm -hmm. And this is what's happening in war. But in any case, when you uh, see the numbers from 48, you see that we had something like 700, about, they are talking about 700 thousands of refugees. Today we are talking about 8 million refugees, or 9, depends how you count them. Which means that if you want to bring the refugees back to Israel, <coughs> Israel will not exist as a Jewish state because you are bringing 9 million people, 9 million people that, of course, will not accept the fact that this is a Jewish state. So, this is another problem, and it's not about right or left. There are people in the left that are not willing to accept even one refugee, and it doesn't matter what it means because they think it will be just the entrance for others. And there are people in the right wing that think that it was to think about these different solutions. But this is an issue that there is no, right now, a good solution. Because Abu Mazen, as a Palestinian leader, is not talking only about the people that sit, that sit inside uh, Judea and Samaria. Or the people that sit in Gaza, and we will speak about it if he is talking if he's, the, if he's the leader of Gaza or not, but he's also, he's also see himself as one as someone that's responsible for the refugees that sit in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, in other places, and think that in order to give up, in order to compromise as a peace agreement probably will uh, uh, force him to do, he need actually to take a very hard decision, and I'm not sure that Abu Mazen is the right person to take it, but this is another subject. The first uh, uh, problem is the issue of incitement. And this is one thing that is uh, raising time after time in different uh, uh, negotiations, in different circles of, uh, of peace negotiations. The fact that the Palestinian educational system is still holding the uh, incitement, still using incitement and still uh, accepting different kind of incitement against, by the way, it's not against Israelis, it's against Jews in general. The fact that they are still demonizing Jews in their textbooks. The fact that the Palestinian TV a, a formal channel and other channels are still holding different incitement uh, programs disturbing many Israelis and also I will say stopping uh, the formal Israelis representatives when they are getting to some points about solutions and about the, um, the options for the future. And why that? Because as we saw in the past and as we see today in general in the Middle East, there is no stability in the Middle East. There is no one regime in the Middle East that you can be sure that will stay there for the next 10 or 20 years. And for that reason, you can do two things, or to trust the leaders, which will not, for, will not be there for sure in the next generation, or to trust the people. Right now, at least as the Ud Barak 
ex-prime minister and ex-minister of, uh, uh, of defense said, right now most of the Israelis see themselves as villa in the jungle. And they are not ready or they are not uh, willing to take the risk and to sign an agreement with a with group or with the Palestinians that still use the same motives that disturbed them in the past. Another thing, it what is what is the meaning of independent state, and what is the meaning of state at all? Now, all the agreements until now talked about demilitarized state, which means that they will not have, if there is a Palestinian state, they will not have any kind of a military force, and they will not have a air force, a, and they will not be able to smuggle weapon. But as we saw. In this period, specifically in Gaza, as we saw, it's not about letting them or not letting them. It's not about declaration and it's not about signing agreements. If one wants to smuggle weapon inside his place, if, if one wants to create weapons and to create and to manufacture different missiles, he can do that. And if there are other actors like Iran. Qatar or other actors in the Middle East, they can also help him in order to uh, um, in order to create a new military. Even those that you signed an agreement. Now, one thing that I talked about it in the last uh, uh, lecture, Ben Gurion Airport. I spoke about the fact that today, when we are talking. Today, when we're checking, and most of the Israelis are worried about the tunnels that uh, the Hamas digged into from Gaza, under the ground, into Israel, and the people from the kibbutzim are worried about the fact that they will, they may find themselves in the future coping with terrorists that coming from under the ground. But the real strategic threat in this operation was the fact that the Hamas had opportunity to shut down Ben Gurion Airport for a few hours. Now, if you are taking that under consideration and you check the distance between Ben Gurion Airport to different cities inside the uh, Judea and Samaria, you find that this threat is uh, existential for Israel because without any long range missiles, only with and without any smart bombs and without any uh, sophisticated weapons, they can actually shut down the Ben Gurion airport if they want to. And this is one thing that Israel should take under consideration. Another thing is the Jordan, uh, Jordan border or the Jordan Valley. In his speech in the Congress, Netanyahu said that he wants to have an Israeli presence inside the Jordan Valley. But, when he spoke, we didn't know that the Islamic State or IS, yes. IS, IS, we call it Daesh, will be in the border between Syria and Jordan. We didn't know that the, the powers will change. The only thing that we know is that what we see today, it's not, go, it's not what we'll see tomorrow. And if... Israel is willing to give up on the Jordan Valley, it means that it might give up on the opportunity to stop different powers and different forces that will cross from Jordan to Israel. Another issue, Gaza. In 2006, the Hamas gained the elections inside Gaza Strip. A few days after that, most of the Fatah leaders and the Fatah presenters study how to fly <laughs> from windows and from balconies in the cell floor. Mm. Now, the fact that no Fatah representatives stayed in Gaza Strip and the fact that Abu Mazen today cannot get into Gaza, maybe he will be able in the future, but the fact that the Hamas is not really what it, has no will to cooperate with the Fatah means that we need to think 
again <coughs> about the two-state solution. The idea in Oslo agreement was that, that we will find a way to create some kind of, a, a, of pipe. No one really thought about it deeply, and this is about like, another thing that didn't happen in the small world, how you create some kind of linkage between Gaza Strip, and you, if you see the map, this is Gaza Strip, and this is the area of Judea and Samaria, so how you create some pipe, and I will show you in a few minutes, between Gaza Strip and between the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. And the fact that today Abu Mazen still has no control on Gaza Strip and on the people in Gaza Strip influence also the different type of solutions and how you can create those solutions. And the last thing that I would like to mention is the fact that the Palestinians in Gaza are under the control of the Hamas, which is a terror organization, and the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria are under the control of Abu Mazen, which is very moderate and is much more closer to the West and to the uh, democratic values. But still, for the last 12 years, there are no elections in the PA, and for that reason, it's still a society without, without that we cannot really predict how they see Israel and how they think about any kind of a peace agreement. Now, after I mentioned all those limitations, I would like to jump into a bit of history, a bit of history of what happened and the different solutions that we have on the ground. Now, all those limitations are not, I know that are, they sound very strong, but all those limitations are familiar to most of the Israelis from the left and from the right. Different people think different things about those limitations. There are people that are willing to accept part of them. There are people in Israel that are willing to give up on part of them. There are people that are not willing to give up on nothing, and they think that we need to stay in the same place. But all of those limitations exist. This is part of the facts when you are going to the table to negotiate with the Palestinians, this is part of what we need to do, or to understand. So, Peel Commission was the first one, the first time that the Palestinians shot themselves in the leg. They had opportunity to gain most of the territory. The British, uh, Great Britain offered the Israelis, you know how many percents of the territory? Of all... Israel? Six percent. About uh, um, 17 percent of the territory. You see the, the blue part. This is what they offer to the Israelis, which is the north, the uh, valley of uh, Israel, a bit of the, of the coast, and all the other was part of a, a Palestinian state and part of it, including <coughs> the corridor from Jerusalem to Jaffa, was part, all the other was belonged to the uh, British mandate. Now this, is, this offer was the best offer the, that the Palestinians could have. Part of the uh, Israeli leaders that uh, went to this commission and stood and spoke in front of this commission, like Ben-Gurion, Jabotinsky and others, and different rabbis from Aguda and others, part of them even thought about how to accept it and how to, uh, um, how to convince the committee that the Jews has the right, also the rights in the land, and of course that the Palestinians uh, refused. And what we see from the first offer, that in 37, we see in 47, after the UN decision, we see that the part of Israel is growing. In 47, you see the blue part, and this is another option of the Palestinians to gain more territory than they had after that. And this is what they had in 47 before the independent war 
that they, before the military strike that they launch against Israel. Again, another opportunity that was missed by the Palestinians and uh, for the and gave Israel the luck to gain other territories. Now this is the map in uh, 49 <coughs> after the independent war independent war and you see that actually this is the map that today most of the people that are talking about 67 borders are talking about this map which means a very tight shoulder between uh, this part and this part and some magical way to connect between this part as you see the south or the south of the of the uh, Judea desert and Gaza Strip and to create some kind of linkage between those two parts that until now no one knows how, to, how they can do that and this is what we had in 49 until 67 <coughs> now in 67 after the six days war as you all know Israel achieved or gained or had good luck in expanding the territory now I know that today you all know about the deba debate and you all know that there is a internal conflict inside Israel <coughs> regarding Judea and Samaria and different approaches about uh, Judea and Samaria but if, if you open I, th um, I, th I, I think that most of you heard about Iton Haaretz the Haaretz journal inside Israel which, which is the most liberal one and today is the most the most critical in criticizing the uh, Israel policy regarding Judea and Samaria. If you open the headlines of the Haaretz in 67 after the war, you see that they are blessing the release of our homeland forever and you see that there are voices inside Israel that are happy and uh, uh, accepting and blessing the fact that we came back to the, uh, our homeland territory. Now, if you check the Zionistic villages before 48 and before 47, you see that part of uh, uh, the places that Rothschild bought and part of the places the Jews went to in the uh, end of the 19th century, it's in those areas. And most of the Israelis in 67 think the, uh, the outcomes of this war is a bless. There are small amount of people that criticize and ask the questions that today we hear from different, from different parts of the Israeli society. Now, one month after the war, there is a new program in the Labour Party. Today the Labour Party is one of the parties, today we have two main parties, the biggest parties, you know, it's not true that they are the biggest one already, the, the Israeli politics is changing like the, the regimes inside the Middle East, but in those days the Labour Party or Mapai that after that become the Labour Party, they are the biggest uh, party in Israel and they are the, uh, the main parties that govern Israel. And the Labour Party, one of the Labour Party leaders alone, is has a new initiative we'll call later to, uh, Alon Program, and he is putting actually the first program or the first plan about Judea and Samaria on the table. And his plan, I will show you. And his plan actually says that Israel will annex the Jordan Valley in order to make sure that we have a strong border between Jordan and us and in order to make sure that we have enough territory 
and not a small uh, uh, tie territory between uh, Judea and Samaria and uh, Tel Aviv, which is again one of the central city. And at the same time, he says that we are going to take two parts, as you see, one in the north of uh, uh, in the Samaria and one in Judea in the south, and those parts will become Palestinian territory with Jordan, with uh, different actors, and his plan actually creating the win behind the settlements movement. And when the Labour Party, and the Labour Party is the party, today it's the left, I just want to remind you again, the left, which means that they are against the settlements movement. When the Labour Party and the leader of the left in Israel deciding about or uh, starting the uh, full Eretz Israel Ashlema, the full uh, uh, Israel, all the Israel movement, they are putting villages First of all, in the Jordan Valley. This is part of what they see as, a, as an Israeli territory. And the program of Alon is not part of the Israeli policy, but it's part of how the Israeli government is sending people in order to settle those territories. Now, in those days, and still today, there are people that use it, there is a sentence in Mapai, in this old in this version of the Labour Party, who says another Dunam, there is a Dunam in, uh, all right, you use Dunam, another Dunam and another goat, and this is the Zionistic dream. How you reach, how you achieve a land, you put, you gain another Dunam, you settle the another Dunam and another goat you put, and you have uh, uh, the land. And what they are doing actually is to put another dunam and another goat in those blue places that you see. Only after that, when alone is leaving the government, and the government is sending different people or different or the movement of the settlement is start is growing. Only after that, different places are growing inside different territories. Now, in 88, and I'm sorry I will do the history part very short in order to get to the, to the second part, which is the options that we have today. In 88, we have another program on the table. And the program that uh, Paris, is, uh, Shimon Paris, is actually responsible on, is to give part or most of the territories inside Judea and Samaria to the responsibility of Jordan. And King of Jordan, and there, until today there is no real official confirmation unless you are counting the, uh, what Paris is saying, and I met him, but he is saying a lot of things. He has his own history, has charity land. And there is a program to give the Jordans and the Jordanian regime a control on those Palestinians that live in those territories, which is very close to a loan program. But it's Chak Shamir that found out about this program, about this plan, about this agreement. The Paris is, get, is coming to the Prime Minister that day, is, uh, it's Chak Shamir, and he actually cancelled it in a moment. Now, if you ask today, most of the uh, people in the right wing, the people that continue or the people that took the role of Yitzhak Shamir in the Israeli politics, if they are willing today to accept any kind of idea that Jordan will be responsible for the Palestinians, they will hug you in a moment. It's a dream of many right wing voters today. <clears throat> but today it's not exist anymore. The Jordanians are not willing to accept any kind of responsibility for the Palestinians in those territories. What I'm trying to say is that we had different programs, different options, and different thoughts, but at the same time, the Israelis and the Israeli government decided not to take the opportunities and brought us 
to a point today that we have to take other decisions in much more limited area. And in order to understand that, I will uh, share with you the second part, but before that, I would like to collect a few questions about this part. So, if you have something, no questions? Yeah. Would the Palestinians have liked to have been under Jordanian rule? I mean, uh, your opinion of, I mean, everyone's different, but in it as a whole. Look, today, it's, uh, it's first of all, there was, uh, uh, if you're taking it historically, there is a gap between Jordan and the Palestinians, and of course, Arafat hate the, uh, the king of Jordan, and the king of Jordan hate Arafat, and you had the Black September, the famous Black September, when they slaughtered Palestinians that uh, revolt against them, and I'm sure that not. But at the end, at the, at the, the same sentence, I must tell you, that no one asked them in that uh, uh, period. And no one asked them when they, uh, or they were in 48, when the, there is a war against Israel between Arab <coughs> countries and the Israelis, or what we had over there, the Jews inside Israel, the Palestinians took part as, as, a, as an actor that the UN offered him a state and he refused in order to have a bigger state. In 67, or before 67, the same happened because they, until 67, this part of Judea and Samaria was under control of Jordan. They could create a Palestinian state with this part, in the other part. And as you know, most of Jordan <coughs> populated by Palestinians. Of course, they could easily create a Palestinian state. But they didn't agree to create this kind of a state. So the Palestinians, until one point in time, they weren't really an actor from the Arabic League or from the Arabic countries' uh, point of view. And if you are checking when actually they, Yasser Arafat, create the PLO, do you know when? When? The first time? 64. 64, exactly. Before the issue of, uh, of uh, before the 67 war. <clears throat> and when people asking or talking about uh, the fact that terrorism is against uh, the occupation in 67, it's not against the op occupation in 67 because in 64 there was no occupation of Judea and Samaria. You could call other part occupation. But the Palestinians in that point of time, they are not actors. I remember one column that I wrote, that I read from Tom Clancy, that he is, <coughs> that he is a, a, thank you, describing how he sat with a, a Yasser Arafat before he had to run away from Beirut, because of us, because of the Israelis, and he is describing the, 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 how mad he was because of the fact that no one supported him and the Jordians helped uh, the le uh, different forces in Lebanon and they all were against him and no one, uh, no one from those our countries that actually support the Palestinians in order to, uh, uh, to, uh, to send troops inside Israel and he described that and in that point of time no one really asked the Palestinians what they want and what they do, do not want. And you know what? Even today, the Palestinians are an actor in a much bigger play of interests of different actors inside the world. And I'm not sure that the people in Gaza today, or I'm not sure that anyone asked the people in Gaza, not in Qatar and not in, uh, in uh, Egypt, what they want and what they need. And if, what the, if the final agreement, if there is a final agreement between Egypt, Israel, uh, Hamas, and whatever, it's going to fit the will and the ambitions of those people in, the, in Gaza Strip. So what they want is a big question, but I'm not sure that we have the answer, so I'm not sure that it's connected at all to what we think. Yeah. We've, got, we've had so many Arab Springs in different countries. You just said that as I know that a lot of the Palestinian people live in 
Jordan, and the Hashemites are the minority. Has it ever arisen the desire for the Palestinians to maybe do a Arab Spring within Jordan and take over part of that, as it's sort of happening in Syria? First of all, it's option. If you ask about the Israeli interest, it, that it will not happen. We need stability inside Jordan. And this is part of what we know, that if tomorrow morning Jordan <coughs> will, uh, the Hashemic regime will fall down, we know that we might find ourselves inside uh, our neighbors to a, a new Somalia. And this is not what we want, and we don't know, want, of course, that the Daesh or ISIS or other terrorist organizations will gain control over Jordan, which is very close to our border. Now, there are many people, in, not many, but the, the, there is a group in Israel of uh, right-wing uh, voters that says that the place of the Palestinians is in Jordan. This is not, uh, even if they think that this is the right place, this is not a pragmatic uh, uh, declaration. We have about, and I will speak about the numbers, but we have about 2 million Palestinians inside Judea and Samaria, and there are many Palestinians inside Jordan. Those 2 million Palestinians will not evacuate them homes. I just wrote about uh, um, the Tzumud. The Tzumud, it's a word in, in Arabic, which means to connect to the, to the ground. In Hebrew we say it's Amdut to connect to the ground. Now the Palestinians believe in the Tzumud. They will not give up, as they see that, as they see that, they will not give up on the land. I think that the last operation in Gaza and the fact that many Israelis suffered from rockets and still support the government in order to go to a military uh, operation and still were willing to suffer in order to fight the Hamas, it also means that we are we become part of the Middle East and we also, the, as Israelis, will also have our own Tzumud uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. But this Tzumud is, it will not create any kind of opportunity that the, uh, Jordan will become the state of Palestinians and, the, and Judea and Samaria will become part of Israel. Still, we will have the same problems with two million Palestinians that we need to give any kind of solution, and I will speak about the solutions in the next poll. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to defend Israel in terms of a democratic country when others talk about it. But the one thing it's difficult to defend is when they say, well, how come they have been building settlements in other parts of the land? Why don't they stop their settlements if they do one piece? So this is a really good question, and it's a question that a lot of Israel is asking themselves. And in one point in, of time, <coughs> Since I saw you different programs, and since the Israeli government didn't accept any kind of those programs, and since no one put another vision on the table, so as you know, in policies there is no vacuum. If one do not put any kind of a pragmatic vision on the table, other things happen without any connection to a policy or to a vision or to whatever you think that should happen. And without any connection from, for what you're coming or for your view and from which part of the political map you are coming from. If you want to annex part of the territory, you can annex. If you want to, uh, uh, to, if you want to separate or if you want to evacuate one part, it's also another thing. But the fact that Israel didn't take a decision until now open the territory to different uh, uh, phenomena, including creating different settlements inside those territories. And today, and I will show you the map later, it's much more complicated to separate between the two parts. So wouldn't that be, if I was an American president, say, right, if you want peace, the first thing I'm going to do is you want our weapons, you stop settlements, make that a policy. So. Uh, I will say one sentence and we will move to the last question before the break. There are no new settlements in the, in the territory over the settlements blocks. But there is another problem inside this story because today the Europeans 
look on those territories and they see one part. They do not separate between Jerusalem, which is, as I told you, in most of the Israelis' mind, a part of Israel in any case. They are not separating between the settlements rocks and the places in the, those lone settlements that beyond the, those settlements blocks. Which means that if an Israeli, common Israeli, see what, what kind of, uh, uh, what is the general approach in the international community, he understands that everything is the same. And they, if they boycott the goods from Judea and Samaria, from all over Judea and Samaria, and there is no difference between uh, Gush Etzion, which is one of the settlement blocks, and uh, Hitza, which is one of the lone settlements, it means that there is nothing to do, and for this part of the Israelis, they are not willing to do different compromises while the world is not accepting uh, them approach. And I will speak about it, but for sure, the problem, first of all, Israel is not building outside the settlement blocks. There are people that build them for, uh, for themselves and it's uh, in a very small numbers and, and Israel is uh, trying to cope with that. But Israel is not building also in those uh, settlement blocks in general only in uh, different circumstances which unfortunately it's only when uh, the Prime Minister, if I'm talking about Netanyahu, feels that he needs to uh, to compromise with the settlers' movement. Yeah, the last question, then we'll go to... Yeah. Um, did I hear you right in saying that in not having these plans, not accepting these, that it's sort of Israel that really didn't accept the plans that were put forward? Um, I'm trying... Because, uh, you know, I'm putting that into context that we generally... This, the narrative here is that it's always the Palestinians that reject. I didn't speak until now about, uh, about the Palestinians. Right now I'm just talking about Israelis. What we want from us without any connection to the Palestinians. I will speak in a moment. I just said whenever the Palestinians were involved, they had the opportunity and they had the... And, uh, um, Abba Evans said that they didn't miss the opportunity to miss an opportunity. So... They missed any opportunities that you can uh, put on the table, and I can I will show you in the next part. But what I'm talking about, first of all, I would like to speak about the opportunities or about the options that we had, or about the views that we had before the negotiations with the Palestinians. Because when we are getting to the point of negotiation with the Palestinians, from the 90s, there is actually nothing uh, to do the maximum that the Israelis are willing to give is less than the minimum that the Palestinians are willing to accept. And this gap is huge, and as I see it, is not bridgeable, and I will speak about it in the next part. Thank you. Thank you.